So here I just wanted to talk about real exchange rates really quickly, which I use in international macroeconomics. It's a concept that incorporates a traditional macro topic of the real value with exchange rates, which are important for exports and imports as well as macroeconomic policy, right? So to get started, uh, reviewing nominal versus real in economics, nominal is like the face value, it's like the named value, and real is like a quantity that's adjusted for prices, right? And so you can do the real wage, you know, wages over prices. So for example, if you make $20 and the price, whatever you want to buy is five, you know, you can buy four items, right? If the price goes up to 10, you can only buy two items with $20. So price increases can reduce your real wage, but you would view the real wage as the quantity of things you could buy with it. Okay, and so an exchange rate was generally bilateral. It's between two countries, and here I'm going to use the U.S. and Mexico. So it's got to be adjusted for two countries' price levels. Now I can leave the key, the subscript off, but it's you mean the same notation, um, H over F. But here you could have you know the exchange rate of dollars per peso, and this would be times prices in Mexico divided by prices in America. All right. So uh, you could also have home and foreign, which is usually what books use. But in, this is uh, adjusted for uh, two countries' prices. If you notice, you're dividing uh, in a way uh, so that the, this variable on top, the H, the H is on the bottom of this ratio, they cancel out, and the Fs cancel out too. And there's no notation, there's no dollar sign, there's no country. Um, this is basically saying if you had an item in America, you could take it to Mexico, right? It, you do need to get pesos, but whatever purchasing power you had to buy for an American uh, product has to be the same purchasing power in Mexico, which is obvious. it's actually not true but it's taught in economics but so this is basically saying instead of you know dollars per peso this is items per items right US items versus Mexican items right um, and so I view it as <coughs> the exchange rate you trade money when you exchange currencies this is your trading goods obviously you can't just bring goods across the border you need money but you're converting money into currency into more money so kind of three things at once All right this can be rearranged or this is what I had had before right uh, this can be rearranged it's really just algebra it's moving things around Around. The only variable here uh, is if you view this as one starting out, um, you can move the things around, right? You could divide by pH and have one here. Move things around, you get the same numbers rearranged. There's really nothing new. It's just different uh, stories you can tell, different things you can say with it. So here you can say that the home price of the item is the same as the foreign price, right? But you have to convert the currencies to get it. So you take your money, um, you can take your Mexican pesos, turn them into dollars, and then it should be equal to the price at home. Here's this is in terms of one price versus another. This is in terms of the exchange rate. You could say, well, what is the exchange rate between pesos per dollar? Generally speaking, um, things in, in Mexico might have more digits on the price tag. It might be a larger number because the peso is 20 to 1 and so prices should be higher. This is saying that if the price, if you take the price ratio, this should be equal to the, the exchange rate. And that's what we call purchasing power parity. Okay, that's an important economic condition saying that exchange rates are whatever it takes for goods prices to equalize. Right? I don't want to talk about it here, but this has been shown empirically not to really work. So a lot of times you could take this as percentage changes. Um, I generally take a natural logs, which turn division into subtraction, and you take the derivative over time. And the easy way to say it is you take percentage changes of this equation, and here the percentage change appreciation or depreciation of the currency is equal to the inflation differential, right? The change in the exchange rate is equal to the relative change in the prices, not the prices themselves, okay? Um, and so this is absolute PPP, and this is what we call relative PPP. And then we're back to the real exchange rate. This could equal 1 if everything is in alignment, but it could be greater than or less than if the currency is not properly valued. Okay, one final way that I look at this is if you think of this as a ratio of the actual exchange rate, and this is what theory would predict, you could look at it as a ratio of actual to predicted. If they're equal, they'll be one, right? But what if the actual exchange rate is higher or lower than what would be predicted? Then you're going to get a number that's higher or lower than one. Okay, that's how I usually think of it. Okay, so I'm going to work these numbers just with a couple examples with the U.S. and Mexico, and we're going to kind of tell the story of what they mean as well as, you know, how to work the numbers. So first of all, I want to just show that this is from the U.S. point of view, right? But U.S. could also be the foreign country. Nothing really changes. It could be from either point of view. Um, all you do is you flip this, right? So if one U.S. dollar is 20 pesos, which is pretty close to what it's been trading at recently, you could also say one peso was worth 5 U.S. cents or 0 0.05 U.S. dollars, okay? So it doesn't matter as long as you take this as, you know, uh, 
if this is uh, 20 to 1 from a US point of view as home, you could also say this is 1 to 20 or 1 20th or 0.05. It doesn't really matter. It's just flipped. Everything is flipped. Um, it's also important to notice that if I'm standing in America, which I am, then I could say America's home, but really you could have any country's point of view. And that's something that makes international finance kind of a little bit difficult is that there's no really universally defined up or down. Okay, so here you could have it in terms of I take my home money, I go to Mexico, um, I, you know, actually let me do it this way. I, I take my home money and I go to Mexico and I say, okay, give me 20 pesos for this dollar and whatever I see should cost 20 pesos. The price in Mexico should be 20. If I take $5 American, I should get take you know 20 times as much right every dollar gets me five so 20 times five is a hundred and I look the same item should in theory cost a hundred pesos okay this is the other way right if I if I cross the border the other direction it's the same relationship now I could flip this and I could say well how did I get 20 to 1 well I could look at the price tag and be like hey this is you know uh, five dollars this you know five dollars in America and a hundred in Mexico therefore the price should be five hundredths or or one twentieth Okay, flip it again, and I could get the, the ratio of the two. All right, so I'm going to use these numbers, right? One dollar is 20 pesos. You could flip it and say one peso is 20 dollars. That's simply the inverse. And if I say, well, I've got the purchasing power in America to buy ten dollar item, it should cost me, right? I take ten dollars, turn it times 20, should cost 200 Mexican pesos. That's what the price should be. The purchasing power should be equal, or purchasing power parity if the markets are aligned perfectly. And remember, in economics, especially financial or macro, we talk about arbitrage. Arbitrage is the ability to make a profit off of price differences. If I found out that this item was actually 180 and not 200, I could theoretically go to Mexico and buy it cheap, turn my money back, and then be able to like make money off of that. All right? It cost me only 180, all right? turn that back, and I get a little more than $10. Okay? Um, and so that the idea that people make profits should push the prices toward equilibrium, right? So if the Mexican price is too inexpensive, then everyone goes to Mexico to buy it, it pushes the price up and it's no longer 180, it could be 200, right? Um, if it's too if it's too cheap in, in the other country, uh, it pushes it up, but if it's too expensive, it'll push demand down and lower the price, okay? Um, and then the, that's in the goods markets, but you could also have the currency markets where if people need the the pesos to buy the inexpensive Mexican item, they're going to demand pesos and it's actually going to move the exchange rate. Okay, So that's kind of how it works. Now if I go the other direction and I say, well, what if something costs 3,000 Mexican pesos? Right In red I've got kind of the direction I'm going. How many dollars do I need? I can solve for pH. And I say, okay, well the price is still 20. So if I take uh, 3,000, right, and, and the exchange rate, you could say times 0 0.05, it's going to be 150 US dollars. So I could solve for this. I say, given the price of Mexico, given the exchange rate of 0 0.05, this is going to equal 150. Okay? But what if the price, like I mentioned before, is off? And so the price is too low in America. All right? And so buyers are going to come across the border. They're going to come from around the world. They're going to push the price up. They say, that's too cheap. As they're buying more, they're pushing demand up. They're pushing the price up. Or it's too expensive in Mexico, so demand drops in Mexico and pushes the price down, and that'll bring it back to alignment. Or people are going to want fewer pesos, because again, they're going to America instead, they want more dollars, and it's going to push the exchange rate up. And the answer that makes it equal is actually 25. Okay, so if you took 120 times 25, you would get 3,000. So this is what the, we call the equilibrium exchange rate. It's what it should be. 20, right, 20 pesos per dollar is too weak. 25, the dollar should be stronger. And so what we're saying is that if the price in America is too cheap, the goods price could move, or the currency price could move. And so if it's too cheap in America, right, now I might mean that they're lower than equilibrium, buyers come in, they demand dollars, and they're going to push the dollar up from 20 to 25. And then it all equals to 3,000 again. All right, so the exchange rate is going to bring equilibrium to the market so that this equation holds. All right, and so you could say, uh, you know, from the US point of view, 0 0.5 times 3,000 um, gives us the wrong answer, right? But if you put uh, 25 times 120 divided by 3,000 should equal 1, okay? Now you could go this way and say, well, let's not solve for the price, right? We solve for the US price over here and we solved for the, uh, the Mexican price over here. Let's solve for the exchange rate and say, given these prices, what should the exchange rate be? Okay, and you say, well, how many 
pesos per dollar well look at the goods market all right there should be no profit to be made i should not be able to buy a product cheaper in america and bring it to mexico and sell it at a profit they should exactly equal and so the way you can solve that is you say okay 1800 divided by 100 is 18. And so according to this math problem, the exchange rate should be 18 to keep the markets in equilibrium. But I've been working with 20, and the dollar's too strong. Okay, and as I mentioned before, if the dollar's too strong, people are going to want less dollars, and they're going to want less U.S. goods, and that should bring it back into equilibrium. All right, so we can plug in the wrong numbers and kind of get this. We could say, suppose the price is 100 in the U.S. and 1,800 in Mexico. The exchange rate is 20, which we said is a little bit too strong of a dollar. Q will show us that the dollar is too strong. Okay, that's what we can use Q for. Okay, is that you plug the numbers in, right? 1 20th times 1800, all right, t divided by 100, you can get 0.9. Okay, if you go the other way, you could say, well, 20, right, times 100 divided by 1800 is 1.11. And notice that this is, this is uh, 9 tenths and this is 10 ninths. That's not a coincidence, right? Depends on whose point of view you have, right? From the Mexican point of view, this is, uh, you know, if I'm saying America's home, then this is how many, uh, you know, dollars per peso, I could do the 0 0.05, right, and I could say times the Mexican price divided by the U.S. price, I get 0.9. And so here, this is from uh, the, the peso point of view. The peso is too weak, it's below not, it's below one. If I go from the other point of view, right, from the, if I say, well, pesos per dollar, right, four in the home, 20, right, times 100, which is the U.S. price divided by 1800, I get 1.11. So it depends on which point of view you're looking at. But if you say, well, this is the dollar because the dollar is the home currency, and generally speaking, the you talk the way I usually do it is uh, you would say that that whatever gets under the the ratio is kind of your reference point. This is saying that the dollar value is too high. It's higher than one. The dollar is too strong. You can say that it is overvalued. Okay. At the same time, the peso is undervalued. This is going to have an effect on exports and imports because, oh, as we know, a, a stronger currency hurts exports and a weaker currency helps exports. So sometimes countries want an undervalued currency if they promote their exports. All right, so that's the effects that you can go further into macro. But right now, we're laying out these equations. So this is the real exchange rate, right? It, it takes the nominal exchange rate and divides by two countries' prices, leaving only quantities. This can be arranged two different ways. It can be done from two perspectives. And that's true in the in, in business journal and news. It's true in academia. There's no universally accepted up or down, right? But we can take this and we can rearrange it. And you can solve for one country's price given the exchange rates, and we can solve for the exchange rate given the prices, and that's saying what it should be in theory. In reality, things don't line up. PPP doesn't work because of taxes and transportation costs and various different things. Um, but in theory, you should have uh, these three prices should all be in equilibrium because when prices are different, people can make money through arbitrage, right? So theoretically, these should all line up. This is a good measure of how they don't line up. Okay. And so that's what the real exchange rate does. It's used in economic modeling, it's used in trade modeling, and it's also used in terms of assessing companies' competitiveness.